prepare for warp speed as we embark on a voyage through the vast expanse of science fiction in movies and television series. From distant planets to alien civilizations, we delve into the heart of the unknown, unraveling the tales that have captured audiences for generations. Get ready to unlock the secrets of the universe on Code Flicks. Hello and welcome to Code Flix, the podcast where we take a deep dive into your favorite sci-fi and fantasy TV shows and movies. I'm Andre Bonner, and in today's episode, we'll be looking at the lens a machine will go to alter the future in 1984 movie The Terminator. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> This is probably one of those movies that I have watched more than a million times. <laughs> I mean, this movie is, you know, one of those that shows humanity where what to expect if AI ever gets the upper hand and with what we're having in society, what with what is happening in society, at this point in time, it is, you know, a wonder, you know, what the things that it can do. And if it can do those things, what more can it be empowered to do? And if AI, if the AI makes these cool logical decisions that this one in this movie has done, you know, what would a mother's determination, you know, do? How far would a mother go, right, to ensure the safety of her unborn child? The Terminator is a 1984 American sci-fi action film directed by James Cameron. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator a cybernetic assassin sent back in the time from 2029 to 1984 to kill Sarah Connor, whose unborn son will one day save mankind from extinction by Skynet, a hostile artificial intelligence in a post-apocalyptic future. Kyle Reese is a soldier sent back in time to protect Sarah. The screenplay is credited to Cameron and producer Gail Ann Hurd, while co-writer William Wishart Jr. received an additional dialogue credit. So let's look at the plot. A cyborg is sent back in time from 2029 to 1984 Los Angeles. An assassin known as a Terminator disguised as a human male and programmed to hunt and assassinate a woman named Sarah Connor. Separately, a human soldier named Kyle Reese also arrives intent on stopping it. As they both steal animation and clothing, after searching for addresses in a telephone directory, the Terminator systematically dispatches women that share Sarah's name before tracking the actual Sarah to a nightclub, but she is rescued by Reese. The duo steal a car and escape, with the Terminator pursuing them in a stolen police car. As they hide in a parking lot, Reese explains to Sarah that an artificially intelligent defense network known as Skynet, created by Cyberdyne systems, will become self-aware in the near future and trigger a global nuclear war to bring humankind to its extinction. Sarah's future son John will rally the survivors and lead a successful resistance movement against Skynet and its 
mechanical forces on the verge of the resistance victory. Skynet sends the Terminator back in time to eliminate Sarah, thereby preventing John's birth. The Terminator is an efficient and relentless killing machine with a perfect voice mimicking ability and a durable metal endoskeleton covered by living tissue for its up for it to appear human. An important theme that um jumps out to me is of course the AI the ability for it to be um used in such a way or trained in such a way that it has become aware of itself and what purpose it assigns to itself um because often um we as humans we either try to make our own purpose or you know have one assigned to us based on what we believe but the fact that us humans will be able to put something like that into a AI, give it that much um, training. And it's something that has been seen um, since then, of course, since the movie has been um, written and produced and production and shown on, you know, on big screen that um any any AI can be um can can hallucinate and that is a condition that causes it to um do anything that it feel like it becomes creative. It can even tell you lies. Um yeah think that that is as much I can say about that without going too far off topic. Um of course one of the other teams of course would come forth would be um the the lens of which um human humanity would go to ensure its own survival. So you know imagine being in a war a conflict that you don't see any end to something that you're up against a force that is highly technologicalized and vastly superior to you and still trying your best to fend off attacks and go as far as to follow it into the past to confront it and to try to strike a blow against it even though you're not sure if you can even damage it or stop it um that is something i've seen you know come out very very clear to me so let's look at the characters that make the terminator so great kyle reese Sergeant Kyle Reese is a resistance soldier for the TechCon serial number DN38416 from 2021 to 2027. He served with the 132nd under Justin Perry in 2027. He joined the leader of the resistance, John Connor, TechCom's fighting unit where he was assigned recon slash security. Coming to view John as a surrogate father, in the year 2029, he was sent back in time to the year 1984 to protect John's mother, Sarah Connor, from a T-800 Model 101 Terminator. Kyle Reese ultimately becomes the biological father of John Connor himself through a predestination paradox sarah connor sarah janet connor born fall 1965 is a legendary figure and the mother of john connor the leader of resistance during the future war 
as well as teaching him in the ways of where she was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. T-800 Determinator The Cyberdyne Systems Model 101 Series 800 Terminator was sent back by Skynet in 2029 to Los Angeles in 1984 to kill Sarah Connor, the future mother of John Connor, the leader of the future human resistance. It was the first of the infiltrators sent back on assassination missions by Skynet and is arguably the single most significant Terminator unit as it inadvertently fathered Skynet in its journey through time, similar to how Kyrie's father John Connor in his. And of course, because the Terminator became a series of movies, it is a point to note that the characters have developed from being just one-off faces but having multiple different parts. In Rome, Italy, during the release of Piranha 2, The Spawning, 1982 director Cameron fell ill and had a dream about a metallic torso holding kitchen knives dragging itself from an explosion. Inspired by director John Carpenter, who had made the slasher film Halloween 1987 on a low budget, Cameron used the dream as a launching pad to write a slasher-style film. Cameron's agent disliked the early concept of the horror film and requested that he work on something else. After this, Cameron dismissed his agent. Cameron returned to Pomona, California, and stayed at the home of science fiction writer Randall Frakes, where he wrote the draft for The Terminator. Cameron's influences included 1960s fantasy television series The Outer Limits and contemporary films such as The Driver 1978 and Mad Max 2 1981. To illustrate the draft into a script, Cameron enlisted his friend Bill Wisher, who had a similar approach to storytelling. Cameron gave Wisher scenes involving Sarah Connor and the police department to write. As Wisher lived far from Cameron, the two communicated ideas by recording tapes of what they wrote by telephone. Fritz and Wisher would later write the U.S. release novelization of the movie. The initial outline of the script included involved two Terminators being sent to the past. The first was similar to the Terminator in the film, while the second was made of liquid metal and could not be destroyed with conventional weaponry. Cameron felt that the technology at the time was unable to create the liquid Terminator and shelved the idea until the appearance of the T-1000 character in Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Gail Ann Hurd, who had worked on New World Pictures as Roger Corsman's assistant, showed interest in the project. Cameron sold the rights for the Terminator to Hurd for $1 with a promise that she would produce it only if Cameron was to direct it. Hurd suggested edits to the script and took a screenwriting credit in the film, though Cameron stated that she did not do any actual writing at all. Cameron would later regret the decision to sell the rights for one dollar. Cameron and Heard had friends who worked with Corman previously and were working at Orion Pictures, now part of MGM. Orion agreed to distribute the film if Cameron could get financial backing elsewhere. The script was picked up by John Daly, chairman and president of Hemdale Film Corporation. Daly and his executive vice president 
and head of production Derek Gibson become executive producer of the project. Cameron wanted his pitch for Dali to finalize the deal and had his friend Lance Enriskan show up to the meeting early dressed and acting like the Terminator. Enriskan wearing a leather jacket, fake cuts on his face and gold foil on his teeth kicked open the door to the office and then sat in a chair. Cameron arrived shortly and then relieved the staff from Enrican's act. Dali was impressed by the screenplay and Cameron's sketches and passion for the film. In late 1982, Dali agreed to back the film and help from HBO and Orion. The Terminator was originally budgeted at four million and later raised to six point five mil. Aside from Emdale, Pacific Western Productions, Eurofilm Funding and Cinema eighty four had been credited as production companies after the film's release. Sometimes you have a greater appreciation for um some films when you hear the backstory of you know, what happened behind the scenes in the production, pre-production, and so on. And something like this really says, this guy has some crazy, he has some crazy imagination, that is for sure. Critical response. Contemporary critical responses to The Terminator were mixed. Variety praised the film, calling it a blazing cinematic comic book full of virtuoso movie-making, terrific momentum, solid performances, and a compelling story. Schwarzenegger is perfectly cast in a machine-like portrayal that requires only a few lines of dialogue. Richard Carlos of Time magazine said that the film had plenty of techno savvy to keep infidels and action fans satisfied. Time placed the Terminator on its 10 best list for 1984. The Los Angeles Times called the film a crackling thriller full of all sorts of gory treats loaded with fuel-injected chase scenes, clever special effects, and a sly humor. Other reviews criticized the film's violence and storytelling quality. Janet Maslin of the New York Times opined that the film was a B-movie with flair. Much of it had suspense and personality, and only the obligatory mayhem becomes dull. There is far too much of the latter in the form of car chases, messy shootouts and Mr. Schwarzenegger's slamming brutality into anything that gets in his way. The Pittsburgh Press wrote a negative review calling the film just another one of the films drenched in an artsy ugliness like Streets of Fire and Blade Runner. And of course, um, this doesn't mean that the film would not have had, you know, like most cases, um, some amount of goodness to come out of it. Because obviously at the time when they, you know, might have talked about what they liked or didn't like, they didn't realize that audiences and, you know, um, it would soon pick up steam, a cult foreign would ensue, causing several different spin-offs and additional movies, which might be, you know, a teaser here to add these episodes in to... Some of my favorite movements of the film would have been um number one where um, Reese and and Sarah Connor are 
sitting under the bridge and they having the conversation about, you know, um, life, you know, just general stuff that, you know, should be normal for persons. But she's now realizing that with the way how the war is going in 2029, you know, things are much, much different. And, you know, and so they, you know, come to understand each other. Um, another um, part of the film that I, I liked was um, when Reese was in the um, when he was being questioned by the psychologist guy, and he was like, you know, um, so you're telling me that this is the case, you know? So where are all of the you know future stuff? Where's the evidence? So. And I, and I think that was very, very crucial, you know, it showed that, yes, you know, it's normal for people not to want to believe um, a story like that. And you have to be, you know, you have to come with something, you know, fruitful and, and have, um, you know, things that line up a little bit better. But, you know, the situation warranted that kind of response, um, you know. And probably one of the, the, the most iconic, um, you know, most iconic scenes comes um, at the end of the film where the Terminator is terminated. And, you know, Sarah looks into its eyes, you know. It's, it's almost like she's trying to look into a person's eyes and she's like saying, you are terminated, you know. Um, that I mean was excellent. I mean that that I would I have seen it parodied. I've seen it, you know, it, and it just comes back to it being so iconic and, and and memorable. So one of the theories that um I can present here is that. Based on how the writer had written this particular, and we know that there were additional um, stories that would have, you know, or could feed into to what this is, because instead of having a, instead of having just one particular Terminator, it could have been two, right? Um, and it, you know, it's just because, um, he had pulled back at the last minute and said, all right, just be one. And if he had two, I'm thinking it would be a more of a challenge. It would, you know, it could, it could go a direction where one of them was trying to cause the, 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 um, the rise of the machines earlier. Right, meaning that they could have, you know, gone back to just take over, as well as you know to ensure that Sarah Connor's son does not live, you know, or does not come, and that would then set off another chain reaction of um things happening, and of course um perhaps. Reese wouldn't necessarily be there as the the father, right? And I think it wouldn't necessarily need to be the case where he would have been the father, but because, you know, it could be anybody, but I guess you want it to be a case where the father of a child, um, you know, the man that's going to save humanity is a fighter himself, you know, to show that it, it runs in the family, it's hereditary, you know. So, you know, there, there's a whole lot to be said there in terms of what, you know, the, this um, film could possibly have gone and become and, you know, what plot lines could have been added that would make you know make it different rather than to have you know follow up films that you know could you know could do some work i'm not saying they're not good too but 
you know, not as good as the original, right? Because the original idea is based on something, you know, most times when they follow it up with an additional movie, it's not necessarily um, the best and it doesn't stay, you know, they don't stay within the, the, the same world. It seems to extend into something else, or, you know, and kind of makes things a little bit more complicated. But if you can't find that balance, it is truly, it's truly there. All in all, that's my theories. As usual, um, I ask for your comments, your feedback. You know, join the discussion. Um, let me know what you think, what you didn't like, what you you thought that um, made sense to you. Um, what did I not talk about? What did I leave out? What could you add to the conversation? Let me know in the comments. So in this episode, we looked at the Terminator and how cool he was, wasn't he? Nah, I'm just kidding. But seriously, the Terminator and his effect on one person's life, trying to Cut the timeline short for John Connor, freedom fighter, resistance fighter. We looked at the production design, um, what came out of that, what went into the behind the scenes, what was James Cameron doing when he came up with this idea of a film. Also, looked at the reception that he received. Some of them good, some of them not so good. But eventually, over time, the perception has changed based on the way how the world is going, where technology is going. And we also looked at some of the theories that I've had, especially seeing as all there are several different movies and we, we should be able to look at those movies at some point in this podcast. As usual, I want to encourage you to subscribe and to follow um, the podcast for future episodes. You know we're going to go deep into the lore. We're going to talk about the different elements. It's going to be even more of what we understand about the science fiction film and TV genres. Thank you for tuning in and I hope that you will continue to support this podcast. You make this happen. We continue to listen and enjoy and give feedback and it's truly appreciated. See you next time.